Hello everyone and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. Wheat field days are underway and extension and research folks are crisscrossing the state talking to producers and they're also talking about some new wheat varieties. We caught up with our extension small grain specialist David Marburger in Canadian County. Well, right now we're, we're progressing through grain fill in a lot of areas with our winter wheat crop here in the state. As you venture out into the panhandle, we may have some of our late varieties that may still be trying to flower, but overall, a lot of the wheat going through grain fill. As we go further south in the state, we're, we're a lot further along in that process compared to the northern part of the state. I had seen recently where down in Texas, they're, they're already harvesting their wheat, and they're, they're somewhere between two maybe three weeks ahead of schedule from what I heard. And for us here in Oklahoma, we will probably get harvest started a little bit earlier than normal, maybe close to that 10 to 14 days. It wouldn't surprise me by maybe sometime next week if we hear some reports of some combines going through the field down in the southern part of the state, especially towards the Red River. Further north in the state, got a little bit of ways to go yet. Uh, maybe towards the end of May we'll see, but probably by, definitely by the beginning of June we'll probably be seeing a lot of combines rolling in a number of areas throughout Oklahoma. We had the, the winter wheat tour for Oklahoma last week and had some estimates come out. We're, we're, it's been estimated, we're looking at maybe close to that 3 million acres harvested. We'll see if that number holds up once we get through harvest. And we're looking at about 100 million bushel crop, so somewhere in that close to 33, maybe 34 bushel uh, average for the state and I, I think that's going to be a pretty close estimate uh, where where we are keeping the wheat for harvest those are going to probably be our, our better fields the wheat on maybe some of our marginal ground or had lower yield potential was wheat that maybe is already being grazed out or it's wheat that's going to go for for hay or just be terminated in general and maybe go to a summer crop this year we have wheat varieties that dr carver has has worked on releasing the first one is Spirit Rider. So in the trials over the past few years, it's, it was OK10126. This is a, a variety that has OK Bullet as part of its parentage. It's a lot like OK Bullet, but with better standability and better yield potential. The next variety is Smith's Gold. This is a variety, it's, uh, it's gonna be a, basically a Gallagher update. It's a variety that has Gallagher as half of its parentage, and it has a, uh, OSU experimental in it that has TAM 110 as well as 2174. So this is a lot like Gallagher, but has green bug resistance added into it. We're always, again, chasing that yield, trying to increase yield overall, and also on the quality side, trying to find varieties that are gonna have, when it comes to baking and milling qualities, varieties that end users are gonna wanna come and find where those are being planted and buy and source that grain first. Over the past few weeks, we've had a lot of rain in Oklahoma, and Brian, how has, how has the rain impacted the, the soil fertility across the state? So with a lot of the corn and sorghum that goes in, traditional nitrogen management is pre-plant nitrogen and then you plant the crop. As I traveled across the state the last couple of months, you see a lot of people putting out anhydrous or liquid nitrogen ahead of planting. And then we get all this rain, so the question is what happened? The likelihood is we have lost some nitrogen. Uh, whether it's through leaching and any deep soils where that nitrogen is sitting there and the water percolated through, we've had nitrogen go down to depth. We've also had any areas that had standing water for more than a couple days likely had denitrification. That's actually when the nitrogen turns into a gaseous form and goes up into the atmosphere. So as we look at the standing crop with the corn and sorghum or, or anything that's going to be planted in the near future, all likelihood is the nitrogen that was applied prior to the rains has at least partially been lost. So we have to start accounting for that or considering how to account for it. Uh, one of the options would be to go ahead and put out an enriched strip in those fields, get some nitrogen down the strips just to see if there's a difference out there. Uh, the other, of course, is keeping a good eye on the crop. After it gets growing, keep an eye on those lower leaves, looking for yellowing of those older lower leaves to see if there's any nitrogen deficiencies. Or if you just want to bank ahead you know, think about what you think, 
think could have been lost. There's likelihood of 20 to 40% loss and make a plan for an additional side dress nitrogen application to compensate for what was lost. So within all of that, is it really worth doing a soil sample and sending it off? You know, a soil sampling is a great idea and there would be a lot of people asking you to think about that. Mm -hmm. The challenge is if the nitrogen was applied as anhydrous or urea or even UAN, mm -hmm. it may not all be in the nitrate form. So a soil test typically tests for nitrate nitrogen and does not look for ammonium form of nitrogen. So just because the nitrate levels are low may not mean you have lost a lot of nitrogen because it could still be in the ammonium form. So if you were to do a sample to see what is left over, you would need to make sure that you analyze for both ammonium and nitrate. Otherwise, it could be a false negative on how much nitrogen is left over from the season. What about following a wheat crop, say say a situation where they go through and they, and they hay the wheat, yeah. is, is there soil issues there? Yeah, so one thing we have to keep in mind of for all the acres out there that have been swathed and belled, mm -hmm. uh, where there was wheat now going into a cotton, sorghum, corn, or, or something else, is that wheat hay takes up a significant amount of nutrients. Mm -hmm. For every ton, you're probably removing about 60 pounds of nitrogen. Uh, 60 pounds of potassium and, and quite a bit of phosphorus. So keep that in mind and make that as uh, have it in mind when you're going into your nitrogen recommendation for your falling crop, knowing that that wheat has removed a significant amount of nitrogen. Now, if you just burn down, whether this is a cereal cover crop or a wheat where you terminated it and planted into that residue, you still have the nitrogen that has been taken up into that plant and you do not know when that's going to come available. So if you've terminated wheat or a cereal cover crop, know that there's nitrogen tied up in that residue that may or may not come available in that summer crop season. And, and speaking of all the soil nutrition, we're, we're right here next to the Magruder plots and, and, and there's a big event coming up this Friday. Big event. Uh, uh, we have to have a reminder uh, for May 19th, we're going to have a field day. It's going to be centered around the celebration of the 125th harvest of the Magruder plots. We're going to have a lot of things going on though. We're going to start with coffee, donuts and registration on the Stillwater Agronomy Farm around 8 o'clock. Around 9 o'clock we're going to get uh, kick it off with some uh, speakers, some guest speakers. Uh, President Hargis will be on site and Dean Kuhn will be and they're going to be discussing uh, what's going on. Then we'll move into the field day activities where we'll have uh, Dr. Manicherry, Dr. Lofton and Dr. Long talking about uh, spray drift control and so they have a lot of demos on that. Then we'll move to Dr. Warren, Dr. Roccatelli and Dr. Taylor talking about you know soil conservation, forage systems and biosystem engineering. We'll finish up with the Magruder plots and we'll talk about the history of Magruder with Dr. Bowman. We'll talk about you know the data that's been collected in the future of soil fertility based upon Magruder plots. Then we'll end up with a lunch. Well, and, and that's pretty remarkable because 125 years of soil fertility just right over here behind us and it's open to the public. Open to the public, come out and see. Uh, the plots are in great shape. Uh, you'll really be able to see the difference when it comes to the field day. Okay, thank you much, Brian. Right. And we'll put a link to more information on that on our website, sunup.okstate.edu. Any of us in the cow-calf business have those one or two or maybe a few more cows that are just pretty unruly, those that uh, have that bad temperament. Uh, they, they may be good big stout cows that give some milk, but we'd kind of like to have a reason to send them on to town and, and get them out of our hair. Well, now there's another good reason for culling what I'd just basically call a wild cow. Research done uh, back about eight years ago at the University of Florida looked at temperament of beef cows and how it related to their reproductive capabilities. And what they did was they had about 400 head of cows over a couple of year period of time and they scored them for uh, temperament. Each time that they were in a working shoot, they gave them a one through five score 
one being if they just stood still and, and uh, acted pretty normal, five being if they just were just chaotic when they were in the, the working chute, gave them that score. Then they also would walk among them out in a pen and scored those cows individually again from one to five, depending upon how they acted when a person would walk into the, the cow pen uh, with those individuals. Finally, each time they worked those cows through a working chute, they gave them what they call an exit velocity score. In other words, how fast they would depart that working chute. And again, one being very calm, five being those that just jetted out very, very rapidly, very excitedly. While they worked those cows, they also took blood samples and analyzed the blood for the hormone cortisol. Cortisol is uh, the fight or flight hormone that uh, will be raised in any mammal whenever they're stressed or excited. Bottom line to this research was that they found a relationship between high cortisol levels and those temperament scores with lower reproduction in those excitable cows. And I want to point out that in this particular uh, data set, this was a situation where these cows were all naturally bred. In other words, it wasn't an artificial insemination type program where we know that excitable cows are a little harder to get bred, but this was in a natural breeding situation. Therefore, even those of us that are, are just going to uh, use breeding pastures and turn in bulls have a reason to cull those real excitable cows because they're a little less likely to get bred this breeding season and a little less likely to bring us home a calf next year. We hope this helps you as you're making your decisions this fall as to which uh, cows you might want to uh, cull out of your herd. And let's uh, see if we can get a little higher percentage of docile cattle and a lower percentage of those wild, crazy ones. Hey, we look forward to visiting with you again next week on Sunup's Cow Calf Corner. Gant Mauer, our beef extension specialist, is here now. Gant, you and the team are getting ready for a bit of a road trip. Why don't you tell us what's going on? Yeah, we are. Our uh, beef extension group here in the animal science department uh, is putting together an animal science road trip uh, for southwest Oklahoma. So myself and, and Marty New, our area livestock specialist, has, has spent a lot of time on, on putting a, a tour together so we can go visit ranches in that part of the state. And there's some diversity among the, the operations that you chose. Tell us what folks will be exposed to. Yep, absolutely. So we're actually going to uh, house, if you will, Lindell out of uh, out of Lawton, and uh, and from uh, from there we'll move uh, north of Lawton uh, into the Elgin Fletcher area, and and we're going to go see the Blue Cattle Company, MCS Cattle Company, and the Glover Cattle Company uh, on one day. Um, and uh, and keep in mind. Uh, these are three fairly progressive operations, um, both purebred and commercial operations, and we're going to spend some quality time there. We're not just going to get off the bus uh, and, and, and see some animals. We want to be able to visit with those producers, um, talk about ideas amongst producers, and, uh, and visit and, and see what they have going on. And it sounds like the way it's structured, it's, a, it's an afternoon and then the next morning, a day total with, a, with mm -hmm. an overnight. What's that day two look like? Yep, so on, on day two, uh, we're going to start out about 9 a.m. We're going to head south uh, down by Chattanooga uh, and Frederick to the Coyote Hills Ranch. And we're also going to go to the Collins Cattle uh, Operation, which is a, uh, a, a club calf operation as well. Right. Why is it important to have conversations like this and get together mm -hmm. kind of away from a meeting space where that work is actually going on? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think in, in extension, sometimes we, we get into those meeting and in meetings, and it's it's hard to to, to really present um, ideas to their full scale. And there's some producers that are that are adopting these progressive ideas. Um, and, and implementing on their on their ranch and showing how they've been successful over the years. And, and mind you, some of these ranches have been around for many, many years and been successful for, for many, many years. And we have a lot of new producers in the state um, and, and in you know economic downtimes, we need to, to get those ideas and, and be as productive as possible. And share, share that information with folks mm -hmm. who can use it. Tell us when it is and, and what the cost is. So we're actually, um, we're gonna, again,
again, we're going to be based uh, out of Lawton in the Apache Casino Hotel. So we're going to leave the hotel at about 1230 on May 31st um, and we'll go to her north of Lawton. We're going to come back to the hotel for a reception and again some more one on one time to, to visit with those producers and then we'll leave the hotel uh, again on June 1st at about 9 a.m. Uh, to wrap up the, the second day's activities. So, so there is a minimal cost involved uh, and, and that cost is just going to cover uh, the vans uh, to get everybody uh, to the ranches um, and then do contact uh, the Apache Casino Hotel to book your own room. Uh, uh, we're not going to be responsible for that so we, we ask producers to be able to do that and, and the registration is, is online which I think we'll, we'll put on the, the SUNUP website. Terrific. Gant, thanks a lot and for more information on the on the road trip go to sunup.okstate.edu. Well, the first WASG report of 2017 came out, and Kim, what did you find in the report? Well, if you look at the uh, wheat numbers, uh, the 2017 wheat, uh, 1 billion, 820 million bushels. Remember, we had uh, 2.31 billion bushels last year. You look at the world, and that's good for the U.S. Mm -hmm. to be down that much, but if you look at the world, it's 27.1 billion bushels compared to 27.7 last year which was a record goes back to uh, the record that was set in 15 at 27 to 1. I think there is good news that uh, there was lower production in the United States in Russia, Canada, Australia. Those are all uh, hard red winter wheat and competing uh, countries and so you know I think it's looking good there on, on the production side. Now as as we scale that down to a local level, how do Oklahoma numbers look? Well, if you look at the Oklahoma production numbers, it came in at 89.1 million bushels. You know, the uh, wheat tour had that at 100 million, so we'll see how that, that holds. Is 136.5 million bushels last year. If you look at hard red winter wheat, you know, I've been talking about 800 or less. It came in at 737 million bushels, 1.1 billion bushels, just less than that last year. All winter wheat, uh, 1.25 billion bushels. Last year was 1.67 billion bushels. So the U.S. numbers and Australia, Russia, and those are moving in the right direction. Let's talk about the ending stocks because, I mean, that's what it's really all about. You bet. Uh, you look at the ending stocks, stocks for the United States. Again, good news with the lower production, 914 million bushels down from 1.16 billion. But the world ending stocks, are, they're looking at them because of, of the big increase in beginning stocks, or this year's ending stocks, 9.5 billion bushels up from 9.4. And you know, world stocks trump U.S. stocks. And so our price, we should have some positive price increase, but it'll be limited by those world stocks. So we're, we're, we're kind of in a big hole when it comes to stocks. How long is it going to take us to get out of this hole? Well, the general consensus, it's going to take about two years. Now, I think this is a good start. We had lower planted acres than the United States, Russia, Canada, Australia, and other countries. So we had less planted acres. Uh, we've had record production. We're looking at, uh, you know, slightly above average uh, yields this year. So we're moving in the direction, but general consensus is it's going to take two years, which we'll, we'll have to get into the 1819 marketing year to get really good prices. Okay, thank you much, Kim Anderson, Grain Market marketing specialist here at Oklahoma State University. It's May in Oklahoma. That means it's time for severe storms, rain, hail, wind, and tornadoes. May is also the time of the year for the ripening of winter wheat and canola crops, and farmers are planting summer crops of watermelon, okra, soybean, cotton, and peanuts. May is a dicey time for farmers. They want the rain, but no one wants hail, damaging winds, or a tornado. For a farmer's field of standing wheat, hail and wind are the most destructive. A year's work can be destroyed in minutes. The plus side of storms moving through the state is the rain they leave behind. Wednesday night, a long line of severe storms moved through the state. This radar image from 942 Wednesday night shows the line from Osage County to Stillwater to Oklahoma City to Duncan. Some quarter-size hail was reported and a short-lived tornado in Tillman County. That was the downside. What farmers really liked was the rain they received while these storms moved through the state. 
The green bands were areas that received more than an inch of rain by 9.35 Wednesday night. Altus had collected two and three hundredths inches of rain. Fort Cobb topped that with two and twenty-seven hundredths. For farmers planting summer crops, Wednesday's three-day average of four-inch bare soil temperatures was encouraging. The majority of Oklahoma soil temperatures were in the 70s. Southern mezzanine locations at Warica and Bernieville were the hot spots at 78 degrees. Not far behind, a lot of western and central Oklahoma mesonet sites had three-day averages in the mid-70s. Cherokee, Woodward, and Slapout, all close to the Kansas border, were at 74 degrees. Summer crops love mid-70 temperatures. Seeds planted in those temperatures will emerge soon after planting. With Mesonet's continuous data collection and reporting, we can check in on how soil temperatures fluctuate over the past days. This graph of 4-inch soil temperatures under sod at Fort Cobb shows the warming during the day and cooling at night. What a farmer is looking for is the upward climb as the temperature cycles. Under bare soil, the daytime temperatures climb higher, but also cool more at night, so there is more temperature fluctuation. Combining the two graphs, the brown line of bare soil temperature shows the large daily fluctuation compared to the green line of soil temperatures under sod. The sod acts as a mulch layer to insulate the soil beneath it. This is one of the reasons why mulch is a benefit for no-till crops, garden vegetables, and landscape beds. With warmer temperatures and rainy spells, disease infection hours have started climbing. A map of pecan scab infection hours from Wednesday evening shows accumulations in McCurtain County in the far southeast. Salisaw, Centrahoma, and Tishmingo were not far behind. Even Guthrie and Minko in central Oklahoma had recorded a couple of hours of pecan scab. Thanks for joining us for this edition of the Mesonet Weather Report. Finally today, we learn about OSU research aimed at improving poultry health Senate videographer Kristen Loveland put together this story. These birds are, are 10 days old today. They were taken here last week, Friday. They started with 432 Cobb 500 broilers, and the experiment is looking at heat stress effects and supplementation of probiotics versus no supplementation, and seeing how those effects can you know, influence metabolic parameters and cortisol parameters in birds and hopefully that those probiotics can alleviate some of the stress effects that heat stress causes. Industry is responding to what the consumers perceive as something that is better. They want to pay for something that, um, in this case, meat that has been uh, produced without antibiotics. It has been brewing in the, in the customers for many years, and now we come to a place where a lot of other countries have decided that they will grow their meat without antibiotics. And it's possible, it's just that you need to have a good uh, set of tools that you can use and, and do the job that antibiotics were doing. So with that causes challenges and new opportunities because probiotics could be a possible supplementation and opportunity to use instead of the antibiotics. However, you know, there's a lot of challenges feeding the correct probiotics. Um, they all have different strains of bacteria. So probiotics are direct fed microbial um, live bacteria source. So what that does when the animal ingests that is it causes a positive effect in the animal's gut or the colon. Good bacteria in the animal should be able to flourish more rapidly and cause a positive effect. It could cause um, villa, the little finger-like projections in the small intestine to grow longer and increase in height, um, which allows the animal to more readily absorb nutrients in the gut, and that can help its growth and performance ultimately, hopefully make it more healthy. So the probiotics might be a supplement source instead of using antibiotics in the future. The results show something very important that they were confirming what we have seen before 
that in the very beginning of the life of the broilers are very useful. Uh, and also they are, for the first time, we have shown that under heat stress, probiotics help um, the bird to perform better. So uh, in a nutshell, probiotics help during the, the equivalent to the very first two stages of growth. So if you were to imagine it will be the equivalent to the infancy and the adolescent life of human beings, it's when you need a lot more protection than when you're mature. When we're mature, we, we have our immune system a little bit more developed, but when you're an infant or, or adolescent, there are still a lot of changes occurring. Probiotics is just a fascinating field. I think it, it, we're just beginning to understand how important they are in giving us protection and helping to acquire a lot more things that before we were just thinking medicine can provide. But I think overall, it will be in, in the future, will be a, a, a combination of what is good for you, what a specific state of, of health animal farms or, or humans will be and what will be the most appropriate probiotics that will help to alleviate that state. By the way, that was Kristen's last story for SUNUP. She's on to a new job and we wish her the very best. And that does it for us this week for SUNUP. Remember, you can find us anytime on our website and also follow us on YouTube and social media. I'm Lyndall Stout. Have a great week, everyone, and we'll see you next time at SUNUP.